But to this sort of indictment of slavery vis-a-vis -vis labor, which is not uncommon in the Republican Party, Lincoln adds a clear perception of the moral dimension. Lincoln talks about the moral issue of slavery. Um, in one speech, he says, I've always hated slavery, I think, as much as any abolitionist. There's no reason to doubt the sincerity of that, even though it's hard to figure out as a politician how to act on it. Um, his person, Lincoln did not write a lot of personal letters. One of the problems for historians, he didn't keep a diary. He didn't write a lot of letters. He didn't confide in people very much. He, the collected works of Lincoln is like eight volumes, and it's mostly speeches and things like that. The collected works of Jefferson is still not finished, and it's well over 100 volumes. Jefferson was writing every single day of his life, not Lincoln. But one famous letter by Lincoln uh, in 1855 to his friend Joshua Speed, who, was a, who had, lived, they had lived in Illinois, Speed went back to Kentucky and became a slave owner. Um, and in this letter, Lincoln recalls, this is 1855, he recalls a ride, a, a journey they'd taken on a boat in 1841 on the Ohio River where they had seen a group of slaves chained and being taken to New Orleans, uh, no, to St. Louis, to be sold at a slave market. And Lincoln writes, that sight was a continual torment to me, and I see something like it every time I touch the Ohio River. You ought to appreciate how much the great body of the northern people do crucify their feelings in order to maintain their loyalty to the Constitution and Union. Crucify their feelings. Quite a phrase. Why? Why do, because they're loyal to the Constitution, loyal to the Union. He's a man of the system. He's a politician. He's a lawyer. So he keeps quiet about it. Or later in the same letter he says about fugitive slaves, I confess I hate to see the poor creatures hunted down, but I bite my lip and keep silent. Why does he keep silent? Because the right to get their fugitive slaves back is in the Constitution. Distasteful as it is, he says, we must abide by the rule of law. He's not one of those like Seward who will talk about the higher law, the law of morality or religion or whatever it is. No. Lincoln is a nationalist. He's a believer in democracy. He's a believer in American mission, the last best hope of man. Again, these are not unusual ideas for Lincoln. The notion of America having a sort of, you know, special or exceptional, to use the phrase, you know, exceptional mission in the world to spread democracy is widespread from the American Revolution down to the present day. Lincoln uses it as an argument against slavery. See, one of my points, Lincoln is taking very common ideas in his society and mobilizing them into an anti-slavery argument. That is what makes his argument so effective. It is appealing to the base you know, values of, not the, the basic values of his, uh, of northern uh, society. In his great Peoria, 1854, when he comes back onto the political stage with his great speech in Peoria, Illinois, opposing the Kansas-Nebraska Act, why am I opposed to the expansion of slavery, he says. Well, I hate it, the expansion, because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. Monstrous injustice, that is abolitionist language. That is not political language. That's the language of the abolitionists, the monstrous injustice. But I also hate it because it deprives our Republican example of its just influence in the world. It enables the enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites. It causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity. Slavery is, a, is an impediment to the United States actually fulfilling this world mission. See, Jefferson can talk about America as an empire of liberty, and yet slavery is part of it. Slavery is part of the empire of liberty. Lincoln says, no, no, you can't, that's hypocritical. We cannot spread the idea of democracy in the world if we have slavery. It makes us look like complete hypocrites. Um, and it makes others doubt our sincerity, he says. Um, and this is at the root of his, this, is, this poses a tremendous dilemma for a guy like Lincoln. 
On the one hand, we've got to do something about slavery. On the other hand, to do so may threaten the Union. If the nation breaks up over slavery, it will destroy this mission, this democratic mission that the United States has been given by, well, by someone. Lincoln is not a very religious guy. He doesn't think it comes from God. He doesn't use the phrase manifest destiny, which suggests it's you know, beyond human um, uh, creation. And as I said, he opposed the Mexican War. He does not believe in violent expansion of the, the American empire. He believes in spreading democracy by example, perfecting our own society in order to demonstrate to the world the superiority of free institutions. In the same letter to Speed, this magnificent letter, he talks about the know-nothings. August 1855, he's in this political limbo. He says, I think I'm a Whig, but the Whig there are no Whigs, so I can't be that. I'm certainly not a know-nothing, he says. Why? How could I be? How can anyone who abhors the oppression of Negroes be in favor of degrading classes of white people? As a nation, we've, our progress in degeneracy appears to me uh, pretty rapid. As a nation, we began by declaring all men are created equal. We now practically read it, all men are created equal except Negroes. When the know-nothings get control, it will read all men are created equal except Negroes and foreigners and Catholics. When it comes to this, I would prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty, to Russia, for instance where despotism can be taken pure without the base alloy of hypocrisy. I, I, by the way, I just uh, look at the brilliance of that language, the base alloy. What politician today could come up with a phrase like that? that it's a brilliant phrase, and I, I say this because Lincoln was completely self-educated. He had one year, it makes you wonder if this whole place we're in is necessary. Lincoln had one year of formal schooling in his entire life. Everything he knew was self-education. Lincoln figured out very early that this is not the way to get ahead. This is not the way to get ahead in this society. The way to get ahead is through his mind. He's a big, strong guy. That's not the way to get ahead. It's, to, it's through thinking, learning, education. That's how he gets ahead. And, um, it's, he's, he, he somehow managed to uh, develop through reading a command of the English language, second only probably to Jefferson among all the presidents uh, of the United States. Now Lincoln also, one other aspect of this vision he's putting out in the 1850s is that, you know, like he's not an abolitionist, as I say. William Lloyd Garrison burned the Constitution Lincoln reveres the Constitution. But Lincoln, like the abolitionist, talks about what he calls the ultimate extinction of slavery. It is not just the territories. He says, never forget we have before us this whole matter of the right or wrong of slavery. The immediate question, though, is it's spreading into new territories. But he borrows from Henry Clay the fra uh, this phrase, the ultimate extinction of, that's what we're aiming for, the ultimate extinction of slavery. A good politician's phrase in that its meaning can vary considerably depending on which word you put your emphasis on. If you put your emphasis on ultimate, it may take a very long time. At one point, Lincoln even said, well, it may take 100 years to get rid of slavery. I mean, that would mean slavery would exist up to 1950 or something. But he's talking about extinction. What the South hears is, here is a guy who wants to get rid of slavery. Not tomorrow, sometime in the future. But we're, that's, no, that's no better. We, we are no more willing to accept that than we are willing to accept William Lloyd Garrison. Um, but how to do it? Lincoln is just as unclear about this as anyone else in the 1850s. So my, on this point, then, my, here's my conclusion. Lincoln's political stance combines the moral fervor of the abolitionists and the radicals with a kind of practicality, respect for law, respect of, for the Constitution that can appeal to more conservative northern voters. He incorporates into an anti-slavery argument widely shared beliefs in northern society and culture. 
he is the perfect middle ground in the Republican Party. Not radical, not conservative. Um, he reflects, I think, what is the lowest common denominator of sentiment in the North, and that is what makes him a very appealing political uh, figure in the 1850s.